Hey, it's time for voiceover body shop, and tonight our guest is Byron Wagner. <laughs> Wave in 3D. In 3D, and we're going to talk about all sorts of the the millions of cool things that he does. Right? Okay, good. <laughs> this is a seven part show. It is. It will be. And then, of course, we have some tech talk later. If you've got questions for Byron, which you will be fascinated by, and you'll have like all these questions. Throw them in the chat room, which is only on Facebook tonight. So if you're in our homepage and you're like, where's the chat room? Go over to Facebook. You'll find us there. And you can put all your comments in Facebook. And that will get your questions on this very show. But throw them gently, please. It depends. Okay. Are we ready, Mr. Whittem? We're ready. Let's make it happen. All right. It's time for VoiceOver Body Shop right now. From the outer reaches, they came, bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Whittem, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week they allow you into their world, bringing you talks with the biggest names in the voiceover world today, letting you ask your questions and giving you the latest information to make the most of your voiceover business. Welcome to voiceover body shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Well, good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO. B.S. Oh, really? Yes. Very well-trained crowd tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Down boy. Okay. Yeah, we've got Byron Wagner with us tonight. And people are like saying, who's Byron Wagner? Maybe a name they're not familiar with. But if they knew all the stuff that he's responsible for. He's the man behind the curtain, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely. <laughs> Literally behind the curtain. And uh, we're going to learn about all the stuff that he does on, you know, in voiceover and technology and you're going to have lots of questions for him because he's going to be talking about stuff that you're going to be fascinated the with. The longer he talks, the more questions you'll have. That's right. And the less we'll have Trust to say. Trust me. <laughs> so why don't we bring him on? We should do that. We should. Cut to the chase. Yes. It is now time to bring in his high majesty, lord and master of all that is digital, Byron Wagner. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's his back. That's his front. He's going to come in very gracious, can gracious, I can gracious and gracefully. Hey, it's good to have you back. And your front's Thank not you. too bad either. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. George. Good to have you here, finally. You're not George. No. You're Dan. That's George. Oh, got it. Okay. Thank you. How do you do? Thank you, Dan. <laughs> oh, yeah. Anyway, welcome to the show. Uh, now, people probably would like to know more about you because you're responsible for everybody's life right now. From... What I read in your bio, it, and my my head was spattered all over my living room floor as I'm going. Oh, We're not going to be reading it. Tonight. And you didn't sell tickets. I did not. Oh. Well, there's people watching. Okay. Where can they find your bio, actually, <laughs> so they can read it on it's their own? It's actually hidden, but if you do a search for my name with the minus sign and Cinderella, you will find it. Okay, good. And Thank the you. reason you have to use the minus sign is because about four years ago, with no prompting from me, they invented a new anime character in Midnight Cinderella named Byron Wagner. Who knew? Get out of here. Who knew? No, yeah, right. There were lots of pictures of Byron Wagner when I searched for that. Yeah. But then I found this 
long scroll of a bio. If they search my name, they'll find VS. Yes. yes. I don't know. The cruel and well, unusual punishment. The wonder of me, yeah. Spiel. I mean, I mean, I thought I knew a lot about you, but then you were there when it all happened. And well, that's responsible. It, some of that has the added benefit of being true. Okay. The bio. okay yes. Good. Some of it. All right. So why don't, why don't we start with the basics then? You're from Omaha, Nebraska, originally. Where the men are men and the sheep are nervous. Yes. 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 Okay. Outstanding. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. And I never you... did anything professionally. Nothing? Until I was eight. Okay. I got a very late start. I started doing magic and ventriloquism for children's birthday parties. And I charged 25 cents and all the ice cream and cake I could eat. And unfortunately, my priorities have not changed since then. Okay. And from doing <laughs> magic and ventriloquism, uh, I got into doing theater. And from theater, I always loved technology. And when I was a very little kid, my dad had a reel-to-reel -reel mono tape recorder. And I will never forget, the first tape recording of me that I'm aware of was when we watched the second live performance of Mary, Ma Mary Martin as Peter Pan, Peter Pan yeah. on, on TV. I'm and I loved flying. it. And I, they played the tape back, and I could <laughs> sing the songs along with the TV. And he interviewed me, and I actually have an interview me at age, an interview of me at age five or six on a tape recorder. And so I thought technology was really cool. I love tape recorders. And so when I had the chance in high school, I joined a junior achievement project. Uh -huh. And instead of whittling coat hangers out of wood and selling stock in the company and then selling the product and so on, um, I hooked up with the company that was based out of KFAB, a uh, radio station, 50,000 watt clear channel uh, in Omaha. And it was awesome because they had Sony C37A microphones and real Ampex tape recorders. And I could bring friends and cousins in Ooh. late at night when nobody was there except the big 16 inch reels of automation flowing through the machines. <laughs> and I could record stuff. Yeah. That's... Not that I would ever do that. <laughs> but that was a long time ago. The right. statute of limitations has long run out. And it was cool. You're and I love that getting stuff. fired anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already fired. <laughs> so, um, so that was just amazing. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And that kind of set the tone. So the next year when I was a senior in high school, everybody else had a car. I had a Robert 778X Crossfield Heads tape recorder, reel to reel that could take 10 and a half inch reels had an eight track recorder in the side Ooh. and cost as much as a car. And like you said, everybody else had a car. That's right. I took Sounds the Sounds like a line from the movie, uh, uh, Fer Ferris Bueller stay off. <laughs> uh, I got a car. <laughs> it was not a Ferrari. I got a computer. That's How's right. How's that for being born? Yeah. Under no, no, that's, I, yeah. <laughs> so. So you would just go around recording stuff places? I or? didn't have a mic. Oh. I had a, co had had a, a recorder. recorder. <laughs> Did you have any friends with a mic by chance? Funny you mentioned that. <laughs> they had some PAs, rock bands, and so on. So I had a very motley assortment of microphones. Yeah. And then I needed a console of some kind, and that, no, no way in heck. So I got some Midland, as in Taiwanese knockoffs, Japanese knockoffs, sorry. Mm -hmm of a Shure uh, M68 mono mixer, hmm. you know, like four microphones. That actually it has the four blue knobs. That's, or that's right. And if you make two of them, and one of them goes in the left channel, and the other one goes in the right channel, uh -huh. you can do some stuff, and you can even have another one for a center, so you can split it between the two and have mono in the center channel. Yeah. And so when I went to school, to college, everybody else had a steamer trunk full of, you know, linens and clothes and so on. I had two steamer trunks. Full of my Robert Seven Seventy X. No, no, I didn't take it. I brought twelve pairs of underwear. Twelve was a lot. January, February, March. No, it's an old joke. Um, and I, so I had two steamer trunks, two guitar cases, a six string and twelve string, and a duffel bag. And the duffel bag had the blankets and the sheets and some yeah. underwear and some clothes. Everything and that was the way I went back to gear. Yeah, yeah, I had I had yeah. my dad's old navy sheet metal collapsible like trunk yeah at virginia tech i put wheels on it and brought all my gear in oh, with that that thing. was so both fancy and it was huge and heavy <laughs> it was a wrong time to find out that they only had a freight elevator we weren't allowed to use no that was look it's haley's comet <laughs> sorry anyway so so, so my stuff yeah, yeah but that was skipping ahead. i'll skip back a little bit yeah to make the long story longer my senior year in high school i hooked up with the junior achievement company that was doing television programs Ooh. So I got to produce and direct a series of 
hour-long color specials that were played on Sunday midday on mm-hmm. a commercial television station, KMTV. And so, you know, you got to rotate around. I, was, I sold ads. I was the director. I was the producer. And when it was my turn to direct my episode, specifically, I got film footage. I did some social engineering with United on the phone. I got mm-hmm. some 16-millimeter footage so I could have some moving visuals <laughs> to the local folk group doing Leaving on a Jet Plane. Right, right. And could invert the colors and make it negative and very trippy and very psychedelic and all that stuff. And on the basis of that two-inch high-band quad tape of the shows that I had done, I got a talent grant to a high university. It was like getting a football scholarship because I had terrible grades. Yeah. But I had great SATs and I had product. And you apparently were a good grant writer. Well, (laughs) I was desperate. It was the only school I was accepted to. So, you know, I needed to get in. And they said, don't worry about it. I said, really? They said, yeah, no, if we want you here, you'll go to school here. I didn't argue with them. Although, I must tell you, I don't have to, but the other school that I was invited to attend was a place called Stevens College Mm -hmm. outside of St. Louis, and it was, I knew it was a mistake. It was a girl's school. In fact, (laughs) the reputation was, and still pretty much is, it was the girl's school where each of the girls that went there boarded two horses. Really? Do you, do you get the picture? It's one of those schools. It was one of those schools. I've never been there. They invited me to come down and... One of the attendees' father was the guy who was running NBC. And they had decided they wanted to get into media. They knew about the stuff that I had done. So of the first two times that they called, and it was a mistake, I didn't call them back. <laughs> it was a girls' school. And they said, no, no, no. We're bringing in, I think it was like five guys. She, Sue's laughing because she gets it. <laughs> okay, hmm, let's think the odds. About 600 undergrad girls, each with two horses, and five guys... And they want to give me a scholarship to go there? I thought about that long and hard, and then I thought, okay, now, if I go to Ohio University, I will be learning from the best and so on. And if I go to this other school, I will greatly enjoy sharing what wisdom I have, but I don't know that I'll really learn that much. Yeah. yeah. So I made one of the worst decisions of my No, I went to OU. Oh, okay. And, you know, and, uh, and so when I got there... It turns out they were the only school. They had built an $8 million, seven-story radio TV complex. Really? And everything else. If you wanted to get into radio TV when I was going to school, you went to J school. Like at Northwestern or maybe right. NYU. And that was about it. This is Ohio um, U and Athens. OU and Athens, not yeah. O State. So the difference right. was 45,000 undergrad versus 17. Okay. So, um, so I got there. I was very jazzed. And then I realized, no, if you want to get your degree relating to broadcast, you got to basically go to J school. So I took the first series of courses and learned about Asahi Shimbun and all these <laughs> foreign newspapers yeah. and things. And I was a little impatient and I didn't want to learn about all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So I changed my major to motion picture production. And I learned about film and I did film sound and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I ended up building or helping build a multi-track, 16-track recording studio in Chillicothe, Ohio, in what used to be a general store, which during Prohibition had been a speakeasy in the basement, and they still had slot machines in the basement. They were all dusty. They weren't being used anymore. Right. And actually, that place still exists uh, and turned into what's now a school for recording engineers. They've, I mean, the, the founder, unfortunately, a guy named Joe Waters, passed away about three or four years ago. But he and... Uh, his brother, who was a carpenter, had gone around and it was a little bit of a cargo cult kind of thing. They visited all these great recording studios in Ohio and nearby, and they came back and they converted what had been a general store, if I remember correctly, into a studio. Except it sounded terrible and I didn't understand why. And I went to visit it because I had a project I needed to do, a multi-track recording with a band. And, um, so you had to figure out why. Yeah. Well, what I noticed was they had these huge doors that were padded on the both sides and really yeah. thick and everything, but you could open them with one finger. Uh. And I said, why do you have like an inch and a half airspace gap around these big doors? And they said, well, the other places had like weather stripping and stuff, but they were too hard to open. Oh, <laughs> I said, oh. I understand. Yeah, I said, oh, this could That's be a reason that point. you're getting 100 <laughs> cycle feedback every time you turn the control room monitors up past one and a half. What if we fix that? And they said, do you know how to do that? And I said, well, let's do a barter deal because I wanted, I needed to record an album. 
And so I, that was kind of how I started getting into recording studio design. And I, you know, uh, and, and it goes on there. You learn by yeah. doing. Yes. Yeah. That's not unlike what that's, I do. That's a lot of like a degree what I had in there to do. somewhere, but yeah. man, you learn don't most force of it. it by doing use it. a bigger hammer. <laughs> that's the answer. Yeah, yeah. If they ask, do you know how to do this? Well, yes, yes, I do. And well, actually, I do. <laughs> there, there's another story that you might appreciate or not. When I was at Ohio University and I was at the film facility, I noticed that their audio was basically non-existent. They had a Nagra, mm -hmm. yeah. they had a three and a four, and they had a resolver so that you could move the stuff off the quarter-inch tape to the 16 millimeter mag stock. But they didn't really have a mixing desk. They didn't have all this stuff. Right. And so I thought, oh, okay. What? And they didn't have a budget. They had, you know, they had some movieolas. They even had a flatbed Steenbeck, which is very state of the art. Hmm. And I found out about this program that they had, whereby government surplus was available to state institutions. Still is. Basically for free. You got yeah. like a, a budget and a credit card kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, yeah, there's this. It was like Aladdin's Cave of Wonders. There's this warehouse in Columbus, and it has all this stuff. You want a Jeep? Like at the end of you... Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Except it wasn't in boxes. It was all like out and so on. <laughs> so I said, could I go look and see what they had? And they had all of this stuff. And it was mill spec, so it was like huge and hammer tone gray and so on. But so I brought back all this stuff, and we had a much more usable facility. That's and so they well. let me do that. That's so great. <laughs> if you're wondering, we're uh, talking with Byron Wagner uh, about some of the cool stuff that he's done. And uh, But let's, let's move ahead in time here. Now, what year is all that going on? When were you in college? Was it early 70s? 1970. <laughs> well, my... I graduated uh, high school in 69, so okay. I was in college in 69 and 70, and then I left. Wow. Okay. I'm a dropout. It doesn't seem to have affected your, your Not my, 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 my much oh, at all. Okay, no. okay good. No. Uh, if you've got a question for Byron, throw it in the uh, Facebook Gently, chat room. please. No, you can, you can lob it, you know, or, or you can do a fastball or a curveball, but, but, you know, because you love being thrown a curveball. I do. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be a few out there. Uh, throw it in there, and we'll be uh, happy Please. to ask Byron that question. But you're going to have more questions after we get into this next stuff. So, how did you get into voiceover, and when did that start? Because you were also you also were acting too. Well, funny you should ask. It wasn't funny at all. It was deliberate. I did my <laughs> first voiceover when I was about nine or ten. They needed a magician for the hands for a Frito Lay commercial because they you know they used to put toys and stuff in. Right. Yeah. They had this magic trick of a mouse that you could make to seem to run over your hands because mm -hmm. there was a thread. I, I, I remember mouse. that. Magic right. mouse. Or, or That's they, right. They, yeah, yeah. So they needed a magician and they wanted a kid and I happened to be both of those simultaneously and at the same time. <laughs> so I did that thing and then I found out that you could do, and I was in junior theater and I was in, and actually Omaha was a great theater town. Omaha, the Omaha Playhouse. Okay, here, here comes the list. So are you developing your patter at 11 already? No, that was at eight. <laughs> On my recent <laughs> trip to the Orange, I found an ancient and mystical box. <laughs> yes. Which would cause things to appear and disappear. <laughs> well, no, uh, okay, this is, this is a benefit potentially to voiceover actors. There was one book in the Omaha Public Library branch that was closest to us, which I believe was the Benson branch, that had anything about ventriloquism. And I loved <clears throat> particularly the recently late uh, Paul Winchell. Paul Winchell, oh, yeah. Jerry Mahoney, yeah. Knucklehead Smith. I was also a fan of Danny O'Day, you know, and Farfel, chocolate. <laughs> but, um, but I love Paul Winchell, and um, I love Ventrilogue, and the idea of entertaining people. And I was the oldest of three children, so my peers were kind of adults. So if you could do something that could catch an adult's attention, much less get praise from an adult, yeah. that was, boy, that was the ticket. Yeah. And my father would travel occasionally, and he would bring back things like felt baseball pennants from where he'd been, Sholo, Arizona, with the hand of cards and stuff. And he went to uh, Chicago, went to Marshall Fields, and he brought me back two magic tricks. One was the classic red egg bag, which not surprisingly would cause eggs to appear and disappear. And the other one was the penultimate finger chopper. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned how to do those, and I would go to people and say, want to see me chop my finger? Want to see me course. make an egg appear? Yeah. And people would say no, and I wouldn't listen, and I would show them, and they, how'd you do that? I'd go, oh, it's a secret. 
So people, particularly adults, liked me mm-hmm. when I did magic. And I loved ventriloquism. So my mom took me to the library and I found this one book. I have to find it some, sooner or later someday. And it had a section on magic and a section on ventriloquism. And at the beginning of the section on magic was a quote from, I think they, they, they ascribe the quote to um, uh, Orson Welles, but possibly from Houdini or maybe even Robert Houdin, who I think the quote actually originates from. And it's very simple. It says, a magician is merely an actor playing the part of the magician. Mm-hmm. And it sounds mm-hmm. simple, but the funny thing was, is I didn't, I was eight. Right. How do you pull off the mystic East patterns stuff when you're eight? Right. A little cognitive dissonance there. So I didn't know how to be a magician. I didn't know yeah. what to do. I didn't know how to do the tricks. And then once I read that, I was like, oh, I, like I can do on. that. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And once I gave myself permission, it was easy. Mm-hmm. And it turns out that a billion years later and a year, you know, in a, in a Meisner workshop, I finally was able to get to the same point in terms of acting. But so I ended up to your question. A lot harder when you're an adult, isn't it? It's I would a lot know. harder to do, to, to give yourself permission. I'm, I'm not an adult. I'm, I'm, <laughs> well, then you I'm, have a big advantage. Big, shh. Uh, <laughs> So that's how I got into doing magic and ventriloquism. And, I, and so the way I got into voiceover was I love to read. I, my, I, I learned to spell my first word. My parents' names uh, are, were Bob and Sylvia. My mom is 94. Just saw her over the weekend. Oh, wow. And they would say, my mother would say to my father, Bob, put away the C-A-N-D-Y. It was like, it took me about a day. To figure out what that spelled so i i learned how to read a little bit before i went into kindergarten and so on so i loved reading and i loved performing and so on so i did a little bit of voiceover when i was like nine or ten for you know some local ads and then when i was in radio man i my summer job having had the experience at kfab through the junior achievement program mm-hmm. i got my fcc ticket I got a third class with a broadcast endorsement so that I could take transmitter readings so that I could be left alone. Big mistake. With the transmitter <laughs> in the controls and the remote stuff. How old were you then? Uh, 15. Oh, okay. You're yeah. precocious. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> yeah. And so I got a board shift as a summer job. I had two summer jobs. I worked at independent, wait a minute, something, mach- no, something machinery and supply. Uh, and we delivered things like fire hydrants and gate valves. And on the weekends, I had a job working at um, KBON, which was an all-talk station. It was in a high-rise. And all I had to really do were cue tapes and play them. And then discover they had a monitor speaker in the bathroom. Sometimes the tapes would end short, like a lot shorter. Of course. Like five minutes into what was supposed to be a half-hour program, and I run <laughs> down the toilet paper. Yes, trailing. You got the visual. Grab a cart with a PSA, shove it in the deck. Hit play, turn the fader up, and figure what am I going to do for 15 more minutes? And the answer was, let's play some music on an all talk station. Right. And that's what I did. <laughs> so that was, and, you know, it was everything short of the old joke about, and I would rip and read wire copy. You know, they had teletypes. Of course. And we had AP and UPI and the local stuff and so on, and I would deliver the newscasts. So that was, that was actually my first really legit actually getting paid. Voice to over. talk was yeah. to talk yeah. yes. rip and rip and read is not easy oh no because you're you're like looking at these stories you know the titanic has just sunk just as an example <laughs> boys and yeah, girls you'll yeah, never yeah, guess what happened. happened yeah and you've got to like do it in in a new style after not you because you always have to pre-read and you don't know what the, well yeah. if you can you don't even know what the end of the story is before you start reading that's the beginning. right and it's like you could say something like and only 20 people were killed jeez <laughs> oh, Right. I think I did yeah. that once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> want, I have a great joke that I can't not tell. Okay. This elderly, That's why you're here. This elderly <laughs> woman. Doorbell rings. And by the way, this is I ha- now I have a collection of obsolete jokes that are, they will not make any sense to anyone soon. And this is kind of one of them that's aging almost past. Is it past involved dialing a phone by chance? No, but but close. Okay, so the doorbell rings and the woman goes hobbles to the door. Goes, yes, goes uh, Western Union, ma'am. I have a telegram. She goes, Oh, I've always wanted a singing telegram. He goes, Well, ma'am, this is not a singing. Oh, please, I've my whole life I've wanted. Can't you 
He goes, well, ma'am, it's not, they didn't pay for a singing telegram. And it's, I'm a tear. She goes, come on, please, for once, just, just do me a favor. Sing me the telegram. I goes, okay. Da 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 da. Your sister Rose is dead. Da, 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 da. I've heard that joke. I saw that coming out of Thank left you. field. Oh, man. So, voiceover. Yes. Yes. So, you got into voiceover? I got into voiceover. And when did it bring I you? got the hell out of it, too. Yeah. But you're back in it now. Apparently so. Yeah. What brought you out here to sunny California? <sighs> well,. I was for remember, fast forward a few years. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Remember the part about me um, escorting people into the radio stations mm -hmm. and making musical recordings? Of course. So I started hanging out at the local multi-track studios. Just and, hanging out and just walking well, in Well, the they door would and, let me, you know, they okay. they would I would introduce myself and I didn't was not packing heat at the time. <laughs> that was my second plan. And they had one of them Sears recorders had an 8-track Scully with Cellsync. You could Ooh. overdub. It was oh, awesome. I... They even had an EMT 100 metal plate reverb chamber that sounded like you were in heaven. Yeah. Especially if you crank the sucker up. Yeah, those things are awesome. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. So it was, the, it was the professional recording studio in town. And uh, there was another place, UPC, Universal Promotions, that had a four-track Ampex. And... Let's just say that there is now a technique which is referred to as, as I mentioned earlier, social engineering. I learned the power of my voice. I learned that I could call Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing on the phone, who had a <laughs> brand new 16-track recorder. Yeah. And they were late to the party because Ampex was there and Scully was there. And 3M had decided to take their isoloop transport, which had been used for telemetry recording for NASA, and use it for audio. Hmm. And I had a project that I wanted to do, and, and four tracks was not enough for me. So I said, yes, this is Byron Wagner, and I'm at UPC, and we're considering which vendor to buy our 16 tracks. Social engineering is another word for lying. No, 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 no. Misrepresenting. <laughs> Just kind of... Misrepresenting the facts. Remember I said, you know, look at Haley's comment? Yeah, it's kind of like yes. that. Well, look, I, I did not lie. I simply said we are considering which vendor's machine to use for our forthcoming album. And, you know, right now the studio doesn't have a 16 track and we are the second true. largest studio in Omaha. If you would like to, this, this is a magic word, ready? Memo loan. I learned that from trade shows. If you'd like to memo loan some gear to us, I would be happy to include you in our evaluation. Brilliant. And, and they paid the freight both ways. <laughs> That's and a 3M 16 track, <laughs> it's about double the size of your radio. Pretty big yeah. machine. Big yeah. machine, big machine. Wow. And we used it. We hooked it up to the, you know, the four track console that they had and we used it. And it was awesome. You must have loved and it. while I had the machine, there was a brand new radio station going on the air, KIOS, instruction for the Omaha schools. And they had dug out, well, not really dug out. They had converted the tile lined former, um, cafeteria that we had used as a reserve officer training corps ROTC drill hall when I was there. And they brought in a beautiful, you know, brand new Collins FM transmitter and they redid the rooms and they brought in, you know, serious pros that, you know, to build a radio station with students. This is the days when governments actually threw money at things and gave infrastructure to education. Yep. And stuff, yep. And they, as put, opposed to oh, today where, yeah. So anyway, so they had this, so it was public radio, right? And I thought to myself, um, you guys don't have any kind of a budget for what we would now call radio imaging. Would you like some jingles? Would you like some bumpers? Now you're going to play all kinds of stuff, right? Classical, both kinds of music, country and Western. <laughs> <laughs> and pop and rock and everything. So this is called ham and egging. I went to my friends who had various groups and I said, okay, I will trade you recording studio time. If you do a jingle for KIOS, I will record a song or two of yours. Right. And we had classical musicians come in. We had an acapella choir. We had rock and roll. We had country and Western. And I did this jingle package of like 10 or 12 different genres and they put it on the air. <laughs> so then I got to say to people, oh, yes, I produce music. And I, do you want to hear what I've done? Oh, just turn on KOS. You'll, every 15 minutes or so, you'll hear one of the things that I did for them and so on. Social engineering. That's right. Yes. And then we did send the machine back. And they did eventually buy some machine from some manufacturer. 
But we uh, we evaluated it very carefully. <laughs> And the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to get into how you came to California and all the amazing things you've done since then. But we're going to take a break right now. If you got a question for Byron Wagner, although you're probably totally mesmerized by his life story, we'll be right back here on VoiceOver Body Shop. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez. And you're enjoying Dan and George on the VoiceOver Body Shop. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? This is Virgin Radio. Well, okay, we're not that innocent. There's jeans for wearing and there's jeans for working. Dickies, because I ain't here to look pretty. She's a champion of progressive values, a leader for California, and a voice for America. It's smart. It's a phone. It's a smartphone. But it's so much more. It's a, the files are ready. Don't forget to pick up the eggs. What time is hockey practice? Check out this song. It's the end of the road for Rick. It's just you and me, Rick. When hope is lost. The I-8 from BMW. Who said saving the planet couldn't be stylish? Hey, it's J. Michael Collins. Bet you think I'm going to try and sell you a demo now, huh? I think they speak for themselves. But I will give you my email. It's jmichael at jmcvoiceover.com. Now, if Dan will stop waxing his mustache for a minute, we'll get back to the show. Audiobook narration. ACX, Audible, rights holders, and success as a narrator. That's what you want, right? How about a free class on how to make that happen? Even better, how about three free classes on how to become a successful and happy audiobook narrator? It's about to happen, and all you need to do is let us know you're interested. Go to acxmasterclass.com to jump on the alert list for the upcoming 2020 training that they're offering. Absolutely free. That's acxmasterclass.com. The first class is Friday, January 17th, and they'll continue for the next week. To be able to watch these classes, just let us know you're interested. Visit acxmasterclass.com. That's acxmasterclass.com. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. This is Bill Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem. VOBS.TV. And we're back with Byron Wagner right here. There he is. Um, so we were talking about how you came out to California. Mm -hmm. You're doing jingles and all this stuff. Quickly, how did you get out Very here? Very simple. And, okay. By car or... Boy, my arm's tired. Uh, no, what happened was in those days. Well, first I did. I went to college for a couple of years, yeah. and then um, I found out that I did not need to be in college anymore. In terms of, um, let's just say, avoiding, supposed to evading, being sent to Vietnam, mom, my mom, the mom. Yeah. And see, I'm a voice actor. And uh, at that point in time, if I wanted to be a recording engineer, or record producer, I had multiple choices. They were New York. It's cold and expensive, but okay. Yeah. Um, L.A., kind yeah. of, you know, summer of love stuff happening. Right. Because of summer of love, also San Francisco. There's a lot of recording going on there. Of course. And if I wanted to do jingles, I could go to Dallas, Pepper Tanner. Right. Or if I wanted to do commercials, I could go to Chicago, Kraft, and all the car companies out of Detroit would go to Chicago. Huh. And if I was related to somebody, I could go to Nashville <laughs> or do country or western. Right. 
where and so, everybody's related. Exactly. And so actually, I, I was working at a radio station in uh, KRCB in Omaha, exactly in Council Bluffs, Iowa, across the river from Omaha. And I was eventually going to make it out there, but I started building a mobile unit. I got an old, from Omaha Lace Laundry via a used car company, a laundry truck. <laughs> and I got plumber's lead because they didn't have mass loads. It's kind of like a bread days. truck, right? Basically, it's yeah. It's just a very a nondescript box. Exactly. Right? Just like what you and your dad did. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I took the shackles and restraints out of the back. <laughs> and I put in rock wool and mass load. And we used it, although we didn't use it very often to actually record from. We basically ended up using it to drive up to someone's place and then take all the out. cables out the back and yeah right exactly. and, but so often we'd actually move the recorder inside and anyway record high school musicals and we like ended that. up recording people who became very famous later Hilly yeah. michaels peach and lee anyway in omaha and i rapidly discovered the reason that there were no mobile units in omaha was because there was no market there's no demand <laughs> there was no demand <laughs> i missed that part but you're you were having a hell it, of a time doing it. Hey, it, they won't come. No, but the great news was <laughs> no. it had wheels. Yeah. So when I was talking to a very good friend of mine, a guy that I had recorded when he had come around to our college at OU, a guy named Steve Gillette, his uh, wife was kind of in the background as Steve was calling me. He was saying, you should come out here. I'm sure you get a job right away. And, and I owed some people for the truck that I've been building and so on. I said, well, I'll get out there sooner or later. In the background, his wife at the time, yelled yeah you big chicken and i thought okay wait a minute wait a minute i was planning on coming to la for the aes show the audio engineering society show anyway i was planning on flying out instead i will drive out in the mobile unit and i'll see if i can get a job and i'll give myself a month you guys said i could stay with you until i get a job you have no idea how long that's gonna i be. wish i had your social engineering <laughs> skills <laughs> 20 years. I'm ago. starting a course. <laughs> Go to my website. I don't need everybody it now, else. Is. Okay. <laughs> but I'm so, okay now. so I, I came out to California. The AES show was over the weekend. On Monday, I made a bunch of phone calls. I got through to four studios. So I had set up four different interviews for the next day, which was a Tuesday. The first place I went to, they said, Wow, this is great, but the guy you're supposed to meet with isn't here. Can you come back tomorrow? Sure. I went to the second place. They said, You're just what we need, except you're way overqualified. <laughs> oh, I love that one. It's oh, like, I just favorite. want a job. Maybe we could do like barter for studio time. Mm -hmm. and, so on. and the third place I got to was Ike and Tina's Bollock Sound in Inglewood. Mm -hmm. And I walked in and I saw, there's a much longer series of stories about seeing sure. the console that they had and it's recognizing it was... Tangent. Yeah. Anyway, and I never got to the fourth uh, uh, interview. Oh. They said, could you start right now? And I wow. said, well, you mean like, this was a Tuesday. You mean like next month? They go, no, like now. I said, you mean like tomorrow? They go like... Like sitting now, right here. <laughs> right. Now, they brought me food. They bought me underwear and socks for two days. <laughs> I didn't leave the building for three days. It That's turns amazing. out they had an album commitment to United Artists that they were a little behind on. And it was one of those things timing, where... Timing, timing. That's it. That's it. And so that was my first official gig in L.A. Wow. Outstanding. <laughs> yeah. So let's fast forward a little bit more yeah. here. Because this is a you, really, you worked with really long tape, by the way. Yeah, I'm an old guy, so yeah. there's a lot to cover. Yeah, I mean we can cover it at another time. But that's fine. Uh, oh wait, that's a, that's my cue for ladies and gentlemen, boys ah. and girls, a special for the VOBS audience. I'm involved with a secret project, which I'm not going to reveal to you now, but you. VOBSers, if that's the correct phrase. They've been called worse. You get a sneak peek. If you will send an email to VOBS at ByronVO.com, like voiceover, VOBS at BYRONVO.com, saying, What the hell are you talking about? I will send you an invitation to be a beta tester for an online facility that <laughs> might be of interest if you do voiceover or if you are interested in voiceover. Oh, and right. I will tell you this much further. There is no upsell because we can't charge you any money. So there. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to tell you. I'll remind you about the URL again at the end of the program in case you've forgotten. But now, George, you're saying. I'm Dan. George. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Dan. Yes. You have the halves of your brain mixed stuff again. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Check it. Check out this website. This is really cool, especially if you're you're in voiceover, uh, which is probably why you're here. Um, you've got a lot of patents. You've, yeah. You you've 
you if if someone is like have computers talking to each other, yeah, or exchanging video or an audio and stuff like that. Recipes are porn primarily. Yeah. It, well, it's that's yeah. what it's used for now. Oh, oh right. Yeah, that was is. not what was. I'm sure when you were working. Wait, on you can get money? <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> somebody's making money. <laughs> Crap. <laughs> what are some of the things that you were? I mean, you. I'm looking at this like, wow, you did this and that. Tell them some of the things that you worked on. It was an accident, officer. I will never do it again. Okay. All I right. want to know about the ISDN okay. thing. Yeah. So I'll see if I can shorten this as Please. much as possible. <laughs> We've got about 10 minutes here. Okay. So. Well, there is a person who shall remain nameless. And when System 7 came out on Macintoshes, Disney had a whole slew of Macs, and it's particularly in the animation division, because there weren't any other machines. It would be like 1996. Three, four, Two. or later? No, Two? 92. 92. Because yeah, okay. those are really the only ones you could do any animation on. Yep. So, uh, this person became incensed. They had an IT background, and the IT background meant that they had started off as a bean counter, for lack of a better term. Um, and System 7 had this very interesting feature. Instead of having to go out and buy a fully loaded 286 machine and then a copy of Novell Netware for a couple of grand to set up a file server, Yeah, Max would do peer-to-peer. -peer. Is that the Bonjour thing? No, no, no. Or very early. We're talking Twisted Pair, you know, uh, uh. Apple Talk over oh. existing telephone. Oh, yeah. Okay. Which was great because Novell and stuff needed thick net or thin net because this is long before 10 Base D. Lots of money. Lots of money. And all of a sudden, the networking that existed in the Disney divisions went to crap because to completely and overly um, characterize and stereotype things, women were sharing the things that women share and guys were sharing the things that guys share. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they didn't need papal blessing from the IT department to have a login on a file server. They just turned it on. Oh. <laughs> and the network... Whoop, because everybody was already, they were actually finally using it instead of just oh, execs see. sending each other email with no enclosures. So they were furious and they actually literally went to Cupertino and tried to convince the people at Apple to turn this stuff off. Because huh. they were IT guys. Right. They failed. So they decided. Clearly. Interesting timing with the story in the, in yeah. the news lately about Mac or uh, secure data archiving on iOS or the ability to keep your data secure. So, so anyway, sorry. So the they decided they would do I'm the here next to keep best thing here as long as possible. <laughs> <Apparently>. <laughs> they decided they would do the next best thing possible, which was get rid of all their Macintoshes, which okay. were over a thousand. Holy so cow. there is a woman named Paula. And they Sibin were not Lowry. cheap back then. Oh no, they're not cheap yeah. now, but they're there, there's quite a, a woman named Paula Sibin Lowry who was the head of the Disney Mac Users Group, Mickey's Mackers. <laughs> and Mickey's Mackers had a pipeline to, di because of Disney being a very big Macintosh customer, to Apple. And there was a woman at Apple whose job was to be liaison, her name was mm -hmm. Nancy Merck, to four companies. And if I remember right, it was 20th Century Fox, Disney, Genentech, and um, Kaiser Permanente. Okay. And so... She heard about this doom and gloom. It's like, they're going to make us get rid of all of our... Save us, Obi-Wan, you're our only hope. So Nancy asked around for somebody that had experience with Macintosh and some kind of specialty at integrating technology and the arts for global companies. And so they ended up with me. And I said, could I get some free equipment? I will come and do what you need me to do or whatever. So I went and I did some due diligence. And um, I'm going to skip way ahead in the story. I made the worst mistake of my entire business career by offering to do something on spec in two weeks and then finding out they had spent three years and $2 million doing the same thing. <laughs> and remember the guy I was talking about? It was the IT guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was his thing. Uh, we, yeah. You talk about mortal enemies. Oh, you talk oh, about step by step slowly. I, I became, so while I was there, they said, you know what? Never mind about this problem that we're, and I had said, you know, when I was doing my kind of tech due diligence, and I plugged my Mac portable, yeah, forty some pounds, whatever motorcycle <laughs> battery, forty zones lit up in the chooser, and the only place that had that many zones that I knew of outside of Apple headquarters was the Savannah River nuclear plant. 
because they had a bunch of Macintoshes. Right. And so I was looking down at the zone names and, you know, Team Disney, and one of them said EDF, sorry, EDL. And I said, oh, we had a decision list. This is like video editing. They go, no, no, that's going to be Euro Disneyland. I said, oh, you set up like a fake zone. And they said, no, no, we have a half a T1 line going across the Atlantic where they're building, you know, Euro Disneyland. Oh, Euro, D oh, Euro e Disneyland. EDL was Euro Disneyland. Oh, okay. And I said, but wait, I had just seen Blake Todd, who was the head of International for Disney Character Voices, sitting on the floor of his office with a cassette machine and a stack of DHL envelopes, taking the cassettes out, sticking them in the cassette machine, rewinding them to zero, zeroing the counter, fast forwarding the number on the counter on the notes, so that oh I listening to the God. listening to the audition. Yeah, yeah. For Beauty and the Beast, okay, the Parisian colloquial as opposed to the Quebecois Canadian mm -hmm. colloquial French. And then listening, remembering that for 20 seconds while he ejected that cassette, took the next cassette, rewinded it, zeroed the counter, fast forwarded, and listened to the next sample trying to compare the two. And I said, do um, you guys know you could spend 125 bucks on a Fairlawn Mac recorder? And then you could like digitize the audio and you could send it as an enclosure in your email? Because those DHL things, those are not cheap, right? They said, no, like 50 bucks a shot. I said, and it's not like domestic where it gets to the next day. They said, no, three to five days, which means 50% chance of hitting on a weekend when customs is closed. So it's about a week. I said, okay, and I thought that was the end of the deal. But what had happened was, I I knew that Blake Todd was, you know, staying in four-star hotels and flying first class and not on Disney's nickel. But for uh -huh. the localizers, the, the studios, Teletota and Paris had been given a budget of, if I remember correctly, a million dollars to localize Beauty and the Beast wow. for the French market, because they knew they'd get it all back. Right. So I didn't think he'd be interested in this technology that I had stumbled across that was the beginnings of digital satellite radio, which is two guys, Stephen and Michael Smith, from Belfast, Northern Ireland, who were beating their heads against the wall trying to get people to listen to this algorithm, this codec they had developed. So to jump way ahead, basically what happened was I explained what was possible, yeah. that he could actually be in real time at a session without having to fly to Paris or Tokyo or Frankfurt or Milan. And I said, but you're not interested in that, right? He says, are you kidding me? He says, you're telling me, roll into work at 9 a.m., 9 a.m. here, 6 p.m. France, do a three-hour session in France. Do a very nice lunch either at the commissary or Team Disney. 1 p.m. here, 8 a.m. Tokyo, do a session in Tokyo for three hours. And most importantly, do nine holes on my favorite course before it's sundown, dinner with my wife and sleep in my own bed nudge nudge wait wait say no more <laughs> and he said are you fucking kidding me <laughs> Cha -ching! Yeah. so there were other various interesting problems about creating the codec and making it all work and doing inverse multiplexing on switch 56 and isdn lines but we did all of that what was and it called the which the product uh, the, the, it was the original apt aptex apt right it APT. was the apt codec which is still not widely but Still f it's operational in maybe a few studios. Uh, in Europe, a ton. And you're, it's because it's the best quality, da da da. This is competition to. And then that began, from, yes, the Telos, Telos and Zephyr. all of those and so on. Yeah. 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 So um, anyway, the funny thing was, is I couldn't talk about it because it was all done under non disclosure because it was a very and significant barter, thing. Yeah. And the reason it was so important to Disney was very interesting. Disney was not able to compete, their competitors. United Artists, Universal, MGM, Warner Brothers could go day and date, simultaneous release in multiple territories. Yeah. Disney couldn't do that because they couldn't use subtitles because half their audience was illiterate because wow. they were five years old. They had <laughs> to dub everything, which meant that it took them about three years to get That's around right. and do all this stuff. So wow. the bottom line was on the first movie that they use our system with, they came back later and they said, congratulations, you moved forward. $300 million in revenue by 18 months on one movie. It was Lion King. Had it been Medicine Man or Cabin Boy, the numbers Something would have been was, smaller. Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't. You picked the right movie to yeah. figure that out on. And so then the thing was we couldn't talk about it, but yeah. AT&T and at the time GTE, Pac Bell, were nuts about it because it was a really validating. They had been trying to get video conferencing off the ground with ISDN and telework. Oh, yeah, that, that was like science fiction for 30 or 40 years. Exactly. Right? But that. we had something that actually worked. So yeah. they said, you got to come up and talk about it. And I, to this show called Texpo, and I said, I can't. 
because it's under NDA. And they said, well, just come up and do kind of a chalk talk. And I said, no, but I've got an idea. And this leads into a story involving Graham Nash and a public demonstration at Texpo. And then basically Bo Weaver and Don LaFontaine took two or three years to lobby the hell out of their agencies. Yeah, they weren't, they're not easy to get people to change. No, and the ad agencies, and all of a sudden, it happened, and Don was able to get rid of his limo and was able to sit in his beautiful silk smoking jacket or whatever and use his home studio and do sessions in New York early in the morning, Chicago a little bit later, and then sessions yeah. out here. And that's how the and that's why the, the rest, very first ISDN codec and there's more history yeah. and the rest and, is history. And the rest yeah. is history. And now so that's ISDN one of my is almost history. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're full cycle. <laughs> Flash full forward. Cycle. I know. Questions, answers, misinformation, anybody? Nobody's well, what's your favorite there? alternative to ISDN? I mean, you know they all exist, but they I mean, do, do, and do I've used them all. Yes. Yeah. Um I, it's a little too early to pick a winner. There are five contenders. Yeah. Some of them are free. Yeah. Some of them cost money. Yeah. Um, the good news is we're, the long version, the answer, which I won't go into is that IPv6 should have been here 10 years ago. And that. So IPv6 is, is a replacement for IPv4. Which is what everybody Which is using. what our current IP addresses are. You know, it's one. IPv4 depends on the concept of the gift economy of the internet. <laughs> which is best efforts. It's kind of like printing up a whole bunch of letters, throwing them at your mailman and figuring that some percentage of them will get through right. and then building on top of that, the idea of, and if they don't get through, he'll let me know so I can resend them. So there's no guaranteed quality of service, which ISDN has, because when you make a call with ISDN, it's a circuit switched network that exists as long as you've dialed the call up. Yeah, for it's a direct, it goes through switches, but it's, there's nobody else on that wire. And it just yeah. works. Yeah. So the answer to your question that I'm avoiding is I am using all of them and I, it's shaking out a little bit now, but it will be very interesting to see what continues to happen in the IP, the VOIP space yeah. as opposed to ISDN. Yeah. Because like you can't, skip. you can't get ISDN anymore in lots of places. Right. It's too yeah. expensive. They don't want to support it. It's yeah. not worth it. Yeah. Exactly. They're making it pro prohibitively expensive. Intentionally. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, briefly, you've built you have a, a second new... choice? Yes. Okay. You built a new studio here in Sherman Oaks. I did. You did. I did. It's I, I imagine it's probably almost finished. I mean, you've been working on it since I've moved out here. That's an option. It's been Finishing. Five years. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's been at least five years. What what Not is really this is this is a really high tech so yes, the studio, and uh, we will do another whole season of shows. Oh, there's, there's one of the rooms. Oh, there's yes, that's that's my room. Okay, so <laughs> that's let me. Byron's personal. And, and by the way, the artwork is by, by my daughter. We have the panels on the walls are interesting. They're they're. Well, I found a company that uses the same press that they use to press wood shavings into uh, pallets, shipping yeah. pallets, shipping yeah. pallets. And they make a ripple acoustic pattern back wooden yeah. piece of yeah. stuff that is right. basically a diffuser. Yeah. But it's a tray, so if you load the front of it with rock wool, it's a floor wax and a dessert topping. Outstanding. It is a diffuser and an absorber. And in fact, the coolest part is, okay, boys and girls, physics 101. Angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, except you can't see me because she has the thing, but I'm having a great time. Here we go. All right, I'll show you later. But anyway... So it means that it's, ex here, here we go, angle of incidence, point 13 degrees, angle of reflection, same thing. So it means that sound that comes in, for the example, from the front yeah. has to go out through like three inches instead of an inch or so of the rock wool. It's so not it's not going anywhere. No, it doesn't. You get more bang for the buck out right. of yep. your square footage. Yep. Outstanding. And, yep. and right. those are huge, huge monitors. How big are those monitors? Uh, put them back up so I can measure them. They're actually, <laughs> uh, the monitors on the sides are 55 inches and they're all 4K. The monitor in the front is a photogrammetrically cal calibratable monitor for doing still and video work as well. Uh, that's also 4K. And then there's actually, you can't really see it, but um, that's a little MacBook uh, Pro sitting at the Running center. Running all of this. The, yes, and then the, <laughs> that's right. No, and the, no, actually, the monitors are set up. We have uh, three main computers besides mine. Uh, there are two uh, trash can style Mac Pros and a Mac Mini. And the video outputs of any of the outputs of the one or two per CPU are switchable through an HDMI matrix to any of the monitors. And basically, there are three major spaces if you want to put some photos back up. 
There's my room, which I use for voiceover and the art is as really an office great, and so on. Yeah. That's my daughter. That, Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. This is the most important room I, in the studio. This is the bathroom. Sue is laughing <laughs> quietly because her mic is turned down. Um, I'm not kidding. Go, no, oh. go back. Go back to that <laughs> shot. I need to do a feature by feature. The handle on the left is a shower. The entire yeah. room is a wet room, and that's why it's all tile, floor to ceiling and ceiling. And there's also, if you, you kind of can't see it, but in the middle, down about a third of the picture, is what looks suspiciously like a waterproof marine yacht-style hi-fi speaker. It's exactly what it looks there like. There are two of those, and we have 60 <laughs> watts RMS per channel into those speakers. Now, when you're not using it as an acoustic echo chamber, it's connected to an Amazon Echo Dot. <laughs> so that you can sit on the throne and command the playing of uh, Takata Fugue in D minor, Ride of the Valkyries, you know, whatever you want, as either inspiration or camouflage. So something like, <laughs> you know, Alexa, play Benny Goodman. Works great. Works great. And it's also an echo chamber. Okay. Oh. Now we've done it. <laughs> Is it Alexa or Echo that you have to command? To it's Alexa. Sound? Alexa, stop. For God's sake, <laughs> please, I'm begging you. I was yelling at mine. Is it me or are they getting harder of hearing? I was yelling at what? mine this morning. <laughs> yelling, like literally yelling. Officer, I've never life. seen that man before in my life. Yes. Uh, that was a, a visit. So that bathroom is but, amazing. Yes, go ahead and bring up. There, there are some pictures, some other pictures that people we might want to see more. of a studio. Right. I don't know. Uh, they're under, you'll find them. There's, that's not it, but that's okay. That's historic. That's a, that's a picture of me without facial hair to speak of. It takes me a very long time to grow it. Uh, and that's editing outside of my booth in my old place, which was literally a one-bedroom apartment. Okay, that's Whoa, the live That's, that's, the, that's, that's the video for. studio. All right, so and, yeah. I thought, well, if I'm doing a recording <laughs> studio, it should be like a little insert stage so I can do vlogging. Is that how it's pronounced? Vlogging? vlogging yes. I thought you are clearing your throat. Yeah. Okay, vlogging. And, uh, you know, a little bit of post stuff or maybe ADR or maybe, you know, dubbing or things like that. So um, the one thing that occurred to me, having spent a long time in studios, was you have to step over or trip over microphone cables and earphone cables and power cables and guitar cables and amplifier cables because they're on the floor. I thought, well, I'm putting in a lighting grid. Why don't I? And if you look up at the right hand corner of the picture highlighted by a conveniently placed light, you will see grip clamps on the base I see of microphone stands. So my microphone stands hang from the ceiling. And you will also notice a plethora of cabling and stuff on the ceiling. So you got a guitar cable that goes to a direct box. You got a microphone, you want to plug it in. You need power for something. Um, I, I was able to, a lot of this is kind of sourced from surplus or secondhand places. We counted, and we have 532 AC outlets within the <laughs> studio proper, which is only 400 square feet. But And we have UPSs hooked into them permanently because I thought, well, you know, you want to let some. So that was the live room, and there's also seamless paper on electric letdowns and so on. And if you keep looking, you might find another picture that is of the control room, as we call it. Although the point of building the studio the way that I want it, with George's help, whether he's willing to admit it or not, that's the control room. So again, you know, 55 inch 4K monitors and you'll see RX-7 up on one screen and up on the left, you'll see a bunch of um, the outputs of the cameras in the different rooms. Um, each of the rooms is acoustically isolated from each other and the outside equally. I see Corey. You probably do. <laughs> Corey? Eve, Ibe, something like that? Corey Ibe. Yes. He did a lot of the hand handy He did, things. yes. Yes, he did. Uh, we had a lot of great help. And anyway, so the concept is that could be the mix-down room or it could be an ISO booth. It could be voiceover. It could be, I could, you know, from the live room, if I bring in a folding table, I have a fader port. So I plug that in. I lower the gentle X down to ear level and it's a mixing suite. Oh, no, it's not. It's a classroom. Only here in California, folks. Byron, it's a pleasure to have you on our show. Likewise. You know, we'll it's not George. It's Dan. That's right. I wanted to correct you. Thank you. And I think you're allowed to stay longer if you want. Yeah. I will be happy to stay. Okay, we'll stick around for Tech Talk, which is coming up next. But we're going to take a break right uh -oh. now. We're going to have to do a show from your studio. We're going yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to do that probably That's my plan. in the next couple of months. And then you can get a real tour of this place. Oh, yeah. Yep. It is, it is amazing. All right. We'll be right back and uh, wrap this up and then get ready for Tech Talk.
right after this. Yeah, hi, this is Carlos Ellis Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching VoiceOver Body Shop. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. Hey, it's time to talk about voiceoveressentials.com. And unlike Congress, VoiceOver Essentials keeps their word and their amazingly successful January 2020 sale on their voice-optimized headphones positively ends at midnight, January 31st, Central Standard Time. Only on voiceoveressentials.com, though. Free shipping in the continental U.S., by the way, for current users of version 1 and 2, VoiceOver Essentials now has replacement leather ear pads available and the replacement audio cords for version 2. That's over at voiceoveressentials.com. Go over to voiceoveressentials.com and get your Harlan Hogan voice-optimized headphones right now for 20 bucks off. Hey, everybody. It's time to talk about Source Elements. You know who they are, the creators of Source Connect, that tool that you don't have what you don't have it you should have it it's that tool that allows you to connect your studio to other studios around the world so they can record you from your booth uh, it's a tool you should have because even if you're not being asked for it now you might be asked for it tomorrow or in a month or in a year you want to have it ready to go and know how to use it it's really the heir apparent to isdn technology and it is definitely what the pros are using you can go ahead and sign up for a 15-day free trial of Source Connect over at SourceElements.com. Get it up and running. Get your iLock account in order. There's a little video on there. I'll teach you how to do it by yours truly. And it'll help you get up and running so you can understand how it all works. Then that day that you get the gig, you can activate the license. It's a no-brainer. Give it a try. Thanks for your support, Source Elements. And we'll see you right after this break. I think I heard the voice of a body shop. I did. I did hear the voice of a body shop. Beat old body shop. All right. Well, Byron certainly did have a lot to say. And we have just a little time to say goodbye. All right. Well, we'll take that and use it wisely. Okay. Like, uh, like next week on this very show, we'll have Tech Talk number 26. Which we're taping right after this. Right after this. So if you got if you got questions, ask them right it's now. Still got time. And, uh, absolutely. Uh, who are our donors of the week? Oh, looks like we got looks like we got some familiar names: Michelle Blanker, Sarah Borges, Philip Sapir, Trey Mosley, Shelley Avellino, Brian Page, Patty Gibbons, and Diana Birdsall. I've almost memorized those names. Why? Because they subscribe and they send us money all the you know on a regular basis, a monthly. There's right. a little PayPal thing, and you can do a subscription, or if there's something particularly helpful, you can just do a one shot little. Right. But you you just, in our homepage, just click on the Donate Now button and set that up. Thank you. Happy. Thanks, everybody, that yeah, does that. Right. Uh, join our mailing list, too, because you'll find out what's going on in the show. And you could have your booth on the show. This is this is Johnny George's brand new booth. Isn't this cool? It's pretty awesome, I it have is. to say. And it looks like we're actually in it, which is making him happier than anything you could possibly think of <laughs> uh we uh, uh if you'd like to be in the audience email us at the guys at vobs.tv and if you want to send us your booth that's the other place to send it to but make sure you send it to us in landscape this way. portrait all righty uh we need to thank our sponsors yes we do like uh, Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials VoiceOver Extra Source Elements VoiceOverHeroes.com VoiceActorWebsites.com and J. Michael Collins Demos. Uh, and Thank of course, you. the Dan and Marcy Leonard Foundation for the Betterment of Live and Recorded Webcasting. 
uh, and podcasting, I guess. We've got to add that on there. Uh, <laughs> it's all under that umbrella. Yes. Our technical director is the amazing Sue Merlino, who just followed along with us tonight like you wouldn't believe. And, of course, Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Yeah, we Thanks really appreciate being it. you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we'll be, uh, we'll be setting up now for Tech Talk. Don't go away. Ask your questions. And that's going to do it for us this week. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. BS. See you next time, guys. Bye.